A bada bing bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Murder, Bacon a Mystery episode. And you know what? It's happening. The most, the second most requested bam book that I've ever received. I think, I think genuinely, and I'm trying to play it very safe here, in the span of a 24 hour period, in one day, one full sun cycle, I feel like I at least get one comment on this channel requesting this book. On any random video, one comment a day. Verity by Colleen Hoover. One of the most famous books on Book Talk, a psychological thriller, a mystery novella. And it all revolves around a girl named Lowen. So Lowen's in her 20s. She is an author that lives in New York City. But Lowen, she's you say? Lowen. Lowen. Why'd you make it sound Mandarin? You say Lowen. <laughs> <laughs> she's in her 20s. She's an author that lives in New York City, right? And like most authors that be living in New York City, she's trying to make it. But it's not making just yet. It's going to happen. But not right now. Her roommates are Gustav the rat and Mickey the mouse. Like she lives with rats. Okay. And her idea of Christmas decorations at her apartment are like these bright red eviction notices that get taped onto her door. <laughs> so clearly, clearly things are not going well for our girl Lowen until one day this is the opening scene of the book she gets a request for this mysterious meeting at one of these publishing houses and it's going to change her life forever genuinely so she's putting on her sunday best best outfit that she can find in her closet she's like gustav get off my shirt she pushes the rat away this doesn't happen in the book i don't know why i'm freestyling right now okay she puts on her best outfit I'm like a disney she should be talking to the birds and the rat is like Wait, hanging out what's so funny is she genuinely talks to ants <laughs> okay no this book is unhinged okay so she's putting on her little best shirt no pants no, i'm just kidding she puts on her pants she's walking she's walking to the publishing house and the most traumatic thing happens do you know what a head sounds like when it gets run over by a car. It's like a champagne pop. There was a strange man. He was crossing the street. He gets hit by a truck and the man's head went pop. And Lowen was standing right next to him. And now, now Lowen is standing there covered in blood. She's looking down at her hands, her shirt. They're all drenched. Her shirt is sticking to her torso. She can feel a liquidy substance on her face because it's blood. It's his blood. And she's looking up at all the people that are stopped at this busy New York City crosswalk. And the man selling hot dogs looks over, made a hot dog, just grilling up a dog, a sausage, stares at her, doesn't even look concerned when she's drenched in blood like Carrie from the movie. He just goes back to his fucking mustard and relish. Just doesn't even ask, like, you okay? Nothing. It's so weird, but this is New York City. New Yorkers literally don't care. That's what Lowen says. I don't think that this would happen in New York. I feel like we would all be like, ah, oh, hello? What do yeah. we do? We'd be freaking out. There'd be people screaming. There might be that one grandma that's got the wheelie thing, wheelie cart. Yeah. And like she's seen some shit, so she'll probably keep it moving. Right, but everybody else, I feel like we'd all stop. But Lowen is all like, New Yorkers be crazy. They don't even care that I'm drenched in blood. I'm going to give you guys a preface real quick before we dive into this, okay? This book is one, unhinged. Second of all, the, the main character in this book has a lot of Isabella Swan moments. What does that mean? She is acting like the main character from Twilight sometimes. Okay, what she, does that mean? She has monologues about how New York is a code, code city. <laughs> <laughs> like monologues in her head so about main character energy right? yeah about how she moved to new york to be invisible because she hates people but in this moment she's too invisible drenched in this man's blood and you're like wow it's a lot going on i feel like if i were drenched in blood i would not be having a main character i'd be screaming i'd be in the back of an ambulance anyway she's like that's the whole reason i moved to new york city but in this moment drenched in blood and all these people are still pushing there's a man in a suit heading to probably i don't know wall street finance bro patagonia vest hey watch where you're going the grandma with the little wheelie grocery cart. stop blocking the way lady Lowen is standing there in front of that crosswalk and she just keeps thinking about that pop noise. She steps to the side to move away from the angry pedestrians because they're freaking yelling at her. And crunch. She steps on shattered glass from the truck. The truck that hit the, the man's head that went pop, you know? Do you need help? Lowen feels a hand on her elbow and she turns around and there is a man who looks 
genuinely concerned for her. He's not telling her to move out the fork and way. He's not telling her what's wrong with you. He looks confused. And he's also kind of cute. So she's looking at him and girly gets distracted. She keeps staring into this man's eyes and he repeats himself, do you need help? He's wearing a suit as well. She looks, uh, she looks down. Oh yeah, she's covered in blood. She already forgot. She already forgot. She's just lost in this man's pupils, okay? Oh, she's like, oh, my God. no, 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 no. It, it's not my blood. I was trying to... He's trying to cross the street and then the truck and I was, I was standing and his, oh my God, his head went, oh my God. And Loen is about to panic. She's looking down again and it's so red and she hunches over. She's about to throw up and she's like, water, I need water. Is there, is there blood on my face? The hot guy does not answer her. So that means, yeah, it's on your face, girly. He just guides her to a coffee shop a few doors down. And if Lowen was not on the verge of a mental, full-blown mental breakdown in front of a blue bottle fucking coffee shop right now, she would have thought that it was kind of funny the way that everybody was looking at her when she walks into that store. She looks like she got mauled by a bear in the middle of like Fifth Avenue. The hot man rushes her into the bathroom and they're alone, but she doesn't even care. She's looking in the mirror and she looks, she looks crazy. She glances at her watch. She has the most important meeting of her entire life in exactly approximately 30 minutes. She doesn't have time to go home and change. Lowen starts ripping off her shirt and running it under the cold water of the sink. Maybe, just maybe if she can get the blood off of it, then she can put it under the hand dryer and then it'll dry and then she can put it back on. And she's just standing there in her ugliest grandma, white oversized geriatric seamless bra in front of this hot man, but she could not care less. Wait, why is he in the bathroom too? That's a really good question. Well, I never questioned okay. the hot man. You know what I mean? <laughs> like in books, I never questioned the hot man. That's crazy. Why are you here? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here? He's just like quietly on the side. He doesn't even necessarily look worried anymore or shocked. He just looks maybe a tiny bit amused. He's just standing there handing her wet tissue after wet tissue. And she's just grabbing them from him, not even looking at him. She's wiping the blood smears off her chest and her face. She starts dabbing the wet tissues on her hair because there's blood just caked in her hairline. Once most of the blood is off, she looks up at her reflection and she's got the survival instincts of a grapefruit because she finally realizes, oh my God, I'm shirtless in a bathroom with a strange man that I just met. <laughs> and slowly she sees him taking off his suit jacket and then unbuttoning his dress shirt. Like, hello, what the fork are you trying to do right now? But without saying a word, he just hands her his crisp white dress shirt. <laughs> Lowen is slightly uh... hesitant, but she can't show up in her bra to this meeting. So she takes it from him and it feels... um. It feels expensive, you know? I don't know if shirts go by thread count. It's got like 25,000 thread count. She checks the time again. Oh, shit. She rushes to put on his shirt because her shirt, the blood's not coming off. And also, low-key, she's kind of looking at his muscular body in the mirror. But that's not the point. That's not the point. He's she, shirtless right now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he has like an undershirt, like Aww. a tank top. Okay. Yeah, and she buttons it up and she just looks ridiculous. She looks like she did the walk of shame. She's got dark circles. The blood smears, the blood smears are honestly not bad. It does kind of look like blush. So there's that. And he's still got his undershirt on. He just puts on his suit jacket on top of it, rolls up his tie and shoves it in his pocket. It's like a normal Tuesday for this guy. It's kind of weird. Is he a doctor? Is he Ted Bundy? How is how the fork is he not freaking out? Did he not see the man that literally had his head popped like a bottle of champagne? And he just asked her, what's your name? Oh. Lowen, what's your... Jeremy. They hold eye contact for two seconds before he walks over to the sink and starts washing his hands. Uh-huh. So weird. He's not even like a little bit phased at the fact that she's wearing his shirt and her pink slash red blood soaked top is in the sink next to him. Why are you not, um, why are you not freaked out? He looks at her reflection in the mirror. No, I, I, I just meant that you, you must have clearly seen some shit because that man, his head, it fully, like, it fully popped. He turns off the water and suddenly his face is serious. I don't think you want to know. <laughs> I don't think you want to know. No, but like she wants to know because if someone says that to me, of course I find 
<laughs> you want to know. Even if I don't know who you are, even if you're not hot, suddenly I want to know, okay? And he's looking at her and there's this intensity behind his eyes. It's intimidating, but Lowen doesn't back down. Jeremy looks at her and says, I pulled my eight-year-old daughter's body out of a lake five months ago, a.k.a. his daughter drowned in a lake. Oh, oh um, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I didn't even... And you? I can't tell if you respond to shock like this or if you're just calm. Lowen knows what he's doing. He's trying to make her tell him the biggest problems in her life. They're going to sound stupid and insignificant to his problem of his dead daughter. Like, what is she going to say? My landlord raised my rent. My boyfriend cheated on me. Baby problems compared to his very real, very raw problem. New Yorkers, they love to have trauma contests. And Lowen knows that she's not going to win this one. But she tries anyway. She blurts out, my mom is dead. My mom died. It, it is recent. Um, like a week ago? How? Cancer. She used to live with me and now she's gone. I mean, that's pretty bad. Yeah. And they stare at each other and it's, it's oddly intimate. This is the first time that she said out loud that her mom is gone mm -hmm. forever. But he breaks the silence of a meeting. Are you going to be okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm great. I, I'm all right. Thank you um, for everything. Yeah. He walks over to the bathroom door, pushes it open, and motions for her to walk out. And as she's walking past him, there's kind of sexual tension. Stop it. Okay. Sexual tension. But then her eyes glance at the door and his hand is holding it open. And on his ring finger is a wedding band. Oh my God. They walk out the coffee shop together. They start parting ways and Lowen looks down at her watch again. Okay, she's got like five minutes until her meeting. She should be focused on the most important meeting of her life, but she keeps thinking about what is this man gonna tell his wife about his shirt? Like he just gave it to some girl in the bathroom? There's like five million and three things going on in Lowen's mind right now. The last thing is probably the pop head on the street, dead man on the street, dead, gone, no longer wasting neurons on him, energy wasted. Her brain is filled with boys. So she just saw a man get run over by a truck yeah. and all she can think about is boys. Like, ma'am, she's really out here and she said, I'm a writer, I'm an author, I'm a storyteller, deep-minded, thoughtful individual with such a strong connection with the human experience that I can, I can write novellas on them. But like, boys... On the way to the most important meeting of her life, she's thinking about the hot guy from the bathroom and she's thinking about her hot literary agent. Bro, she could be thinking about the hot dog man for all we know. She's thinking about a lot of boys. But let me break it down. So Corey is her literary agent that she practiced her face smut scenes with in wait, person. Wait, her what? Literary agent. So he's, he's her book agent. Okay. She's and practicing what? face smut scenes with him what's face smut scenes you don't know what smut is smut is like books that are basically uh porn. okay yeah and so she was like you know what i got this crazy hot scene in my book let's practice it out <laughs> i'm just kidding oh, okay. they're forking okay that's all you need to know they're forking and you know what to be fair before we judge her because it's probably not the best smartest career choice to fork your agent Maybe it is the best career <laughs> choice, but you get it. Mixing business with pleasure, perhaps not the smartest idea, but for a second there, they really did think that they were in love with each other. But then she found out her agent, Corey, was actually in love with a different woman. The one that Lowen wrote about. Her main character from her book. That's who he fell in love with, not Lowen. I mean, Corey thought that this fun main character, it was based off of her or it was a relatable person for her. It was the best version of her. And you know, it was, there's love at first sight. For Corey, it was love at first read. He fell in love with Lowen before even meeting her. He just read her manuscript, her fictional novel, and just assumed that the main character had a lot of similarities with the author. Mm -hmm. And he's also the only reason that she even got a publishing deal for the book. And it wasn't a lot of money, but it was something. No other agent even responded to her after she sent them her manuscript, but he did. So they met up, they slept together three times over the course of the weekend. And for six months, they tried to make their relationship work until Corey realized Lowen is not the main character from her book. Lowen is the opposite of her. She's not fun, heroic, easygoing. She's emotionally challenging, stubborn, difficult. She's the type of girl that likes to watch ants crawl 
And she wonders why one ant found itself all alone far away from the other ants. Was it by choice or circumstance? (sighs) Maybe the ant was confused. Maybe it misses its friends. Or maybe, just like her, the ant just wants to be alone. Wait, so the dude fell in love with the, the character from the book. Yeah. And hoping that the author is the same person. Or like has similar traits, I guess. But they are not. Or like thinks like the main character because I guess she wrote it really well. Mm. And he's like, well, there's only one way that she wrote that really well. It's got to be her. What is this? (laughs) Yeah, so she's not the hot, sexy, confident, heroic lead from her books. To start, Loan fucking hates humans. And again, I'm telling you right now, Lowen is deep in her writer era. She's deep in her pensive Twilight Isabella Swan era. But I digress. Even her own mom was scared of her. That's what Lowen said. Her own mom was repulsed. Well, maybe that's a little too harsh. Petrified? It's crazy how even when you're a kid, you can pick up on social cues and feelings without it ever being voiced out loud. I mean, sometimes adults forget that. But Lowen knew that her mom never trusted her ever since she was like a little kid. She always treated Lowen like she was going to do something dangerous. We don't know what that is. Is she going to hurt herself? Is she going to hurt somebody else? It's unclear. Maybe both. But that just... That feeling just stuck with Lowen. She never could make friends. She kept to herself because she always had this inkling of, if my mom is that scared of me, what is to stop all these people from seeing that? What is to stop all of these friends from being scared of me? Okay. (laughs) Okay, but it's fine. Because she got used to being alone. Lowen is a lost aunt and she's okay with it. But still, she still didn't think that her mom would be dead and her very first trip out of the apartment in weeks. She thought it was going to be to Central Park or to her favorite bookstore, but instead she was walking into the sleek glass building of the Pantom Press Publishing House, about to have the very most important meeting of her entire life that she has no clue about with her ex-fuck buddy, ex-boyfriend, Corey. But it's fine, because at least he's a good agent. But like, also, if we're being honest here, she did kind of expect him to text her after her mom passed away to at least check up on her. He did not. The first time that he reached out since all of that was last night to tell her that she was about to have the biggest meeting of her life. That was the first message that he sent after three months of radio silence, after seeing each other naked. That's the first message, which, you know, it kind of made her sad. But again, this is exactly why it never worked in the first place. Corey only cares about work and Corey only cares about Corey. And it's not that he's like the biggest asshole in the world, but he is. But it's just who he is. (sighs) He doesn't do it maliciously. He's just like that. And that makes him fantastic in bed, horrendous at funerals. You know, because you you win some, you lose some, right? Nice shirt. Lowen is deep in her ex-fork buddy thoughts when she hears a deep voice behind her. She whips around, and she's already inside the Pantom Press building. And the guy from the bathroom, Jeremy, is standing right there. And she's looking down at herself. Like, she looks insane. Her shirt is oversized, but it's not in, like, a cute, setting-a-trend type of fashion way. Her dark circles are showing. Her baby hairs are sticking out from her face because she was trying to wipe the blood off of her hair in the bathroom. And the man, the shirt that she's wearing of this man is standing there looking refreshed. A new man, a new shirt. Wait. This is the guy? Yeah. Jeremy? Jeremy. But he has a new shirt on? Yeah, she's like, do you just lug around a suitcase of fresh shirts <laughs> just in case for a rainy day? I'm staying at a hotel about one block away from here. I went and changed. Lowen gives him a quick smile and starts walking towards the elevators. Okay, like a cool hot girl walk off is what she was planning on doing. But no, he keeps walking. He's walking next to her. Oh my God, he's a stalker. He's following her. And he tells her, what do you think the probability is that we're headed to the same meeting right now? Lowen looks up at him and he's hot, but she really does not want him to be at the same meeting as her because she doesn't even know what this meeting is about. But also that would just be a lot. Like after everything that they went through in that bathroom, like she, that's the last thing she wants. It feels very vulnerable. Really? She's not a little bit happy? No, she's like, I I wouldn't know. I don't even know what meeting I'm going to right now. Hmm. Well, are you an author? Yes. Are you? My wife is the writer. Any books I would know? Unless your name is nobody. I doubt it. Nobody um, really reads my books. (laughs) Jeremy pulls out his phone and she interrupts him. Oh, and I never published under my real name, so there's no point. Lowen Ashley. You changed your last name. A pen name? Funny coincidence. The woman I'm having a meeting with in 30 minutes is named Lowen Ashley. (laughs) 
I have a whole kitchen cabinet full of supplements that I never take. And that's because I rely on internet advice a little too much. So whenever I try to improve my health, I just end up with less money in my pockets, more supplements in my kitchen. And if you are on a health and weight loss journey and you feel like you're just paying a lot of money to see no results, then you need to check out the Roe Body Program. Roe's medical experts are available online, just like Dr. Google. But unlike Dr. Google, they will actually give you a personalized and sustainable weight loss plan. Like they know what they're doing. You can do everything from the comfort of your own home, your online medical visit to talking to medical professionals. They'll help you create a sustainable diet and exercise plan. And if you're eligible, Roe provides access to the most popular weight loss shots on the market to help you lose 15 to 20% of your weight in a year on average and actually keep it off. And Roe's partners will even handle the insurance paperwork to help get the medication covered. Over 200,000 people have already chosen Roe to help them lose weight. Average weight loss is 15 to 20% in one year with healthy lifestyle changes. BMI and other eligibility criteria apply. Go to roco slash baking. Sign up today and you'll pay just $99 for your first month and $145 a month after that. Medication costs are separate. That's roco slash baking. They are going to the same meeting. Yes! But how does he know her name is Loan? She told him in the bathroom. Oh. Yeah. And he's smiling at her. The elevator doors open. She almost doesn't even want to step out onto the floor because she wants to panic. She absolutely does not want to sit in whatever meeting with this hot man. But also, he's really hot. So she kind of wants to stay in the elevator and just like marinate in the sexual tension. But he holds out his hand, motions for her to step out. See you in 30 minutes. And with that, he walks off. What the actual fork is going on? And then another voice. You're on time for once. Lowen whips around. Okay, these hot guys need to stop throwing themselves on her, okay? Jeez, like let her have a break. There's Corey, her literary agent in a full suit. He's tall. He's hot. She, she has to remind herself he's also an asshole. He walks up to her and kisses her on the cheek and motions for her to join him in one of the conference rooms. He closes the door behind her and the two sit down next to each other. He always looks so clean. You know, he knows how to wear a suit. You look rough. <laughs> Lowen's lying. They both know it. But what else is she supposed to say? You look hot. I miss you. I want to see your wee-wee again. But also, I saw that guy in the elevator, and I also want to see his wee-wee a tiny bit. Uh, I don't know. Okay, bye now. Like, what is she supposed to say to him? Exactly. He looks at her and says, you look absolutely revitalized and refreshed. It's a lie. Lowen rolls her eyes, and Corey continues. How's your mother? She died last week. He looks taken aback for a split second, and for some reason, that makes Lowen feel good. You should have called me, Lowen. Lowen brushes him off and glances around the conference room. Why? I'm still processing the grief. Corey looks concerned, and now Lowen doesn't want the pity. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. Lowen was absolutely, positively not forking fine. Look, I don't know what her definition of fine is, but if fine is getting an eviction notice on your door every single day and spending all the money that you can get on your credit card, having your dying mom lie to you for months that she has money saved up that she's going to pass down to you so that you can pay your rent while you've taken care of her. You just need to patiently wait until she dies. But then you find out that she lied the whole time. She never had money saved up. She just felt like you weren't close enough for you to take care of her unless she lied about having money saved up for you to get once she's dead. What the fuck is going on? Because she doesn't want to die in a nursing home and she wants to die in her own room with some dignity. But now you don't have dignity because you're in all this debt and you're about to get evicted. And then you saw a man's brains on the cement earlier today. If you call that the definition of fine, like if you look up the word fine in the dictionary, Webster's dictionary, and this is what shows up, then yeah, Lowen is fine. Before the two can sit in their uncomfortable, I've seen you naked before, but let's just ignore that energy, okay? The glass door to the conference room swings open and three people walk in, in a line. Sometimes when you get three people walking into a conference room, sometimes the most important person enters first. Sometimes they enter last. You can usually tell based on um, how they carry themselves, right? First, a woman with jet black hair and cherry red lipstick walks in, followed by an older man in a suit, and then Jeremy. Jeremy was clearly the most important one in the room. But literally, why? We don't know. Because he's the main character, that's why. The woman's red lips, they start moving. They start yapping. I'm Amanda Thomas. I'm an editor with Pantom Press. This is Baron, our in-house attorney, and Jeremy Crawford, our client. 
Jeremy and Lowen shake hands like he did not just see her in her ugliest bra just two seconds ago. <laughs> and they all sit down and Amanda does all the talking. She slides over a stack of papers. First, an NDA. Interesting, an NDA. Why would they need that? One of our authors is unable to finish her series due to medical complications. And we're looking for a writer who we believe could complete the three remaining books in her series. Corey does most of the talking. And uh, what series would that be? Who's the author? Nobody says a word until all the NDAs are read and signed. Her name is Verity Crawford. Both Corey and Lowen are trying to keep their cool. <laughs> but like in that split second, they're like readjusting their faces. They're trying to... Corey, Corey is trying to look not money hungry. Lowen is trying to not look surprised and impressed. Everybody knows Verity Crawford. Everyone. She writes twisted thrillers. Every single book she puts out, bestseller. She has so many fans, readers. She's doing press tours. And she's stunning. And she's, she's Jeremy's wife. Because of course she is. Corey and Lowen, they try to play it cool. Like they did not just name drop one of the biggest, hottest names in the book world right now. Yeah, we're familiar with her work. Amanda smirks and continues. Because that's like being like, we're, we're familiar with Stephen King. Yeah, we, we've, we've heard of him. Yeah, for sure. Our client Jeremy Crawford is willing to offer a flat payment of $75,000 per book for the last three books to finish her series. We think Miss Lowen would be a great fit, though we are reviewing some other potential candidates as well. Lowen starts doing the math, and I think Amanda can see her neurons firing, okay? $225,000 for three books. We would like to see the contract completed within the next 24 months. Lowen looks over at Corey. He looks excited. He's impressed. He's calculating. He's calculating the amount of money with his one-third cut. Yeah, that's how much he gets. Dang. I know. He's going to take a good chunk of that home. Just for sleeping with her and being yeah. in the meeting room right now. Lowen, on the other hand, the money would be really nice. This would also be a boost to her ego, knowing that she was considered... But she can't do it. There's just no way. Before Corey and the Pantom press suits can sign her name in blood, she interrupts them. Oh, um, thank you so much for your consideration. Truly, I'm really grateful. But I do think that there will be authors that are a better fit for this project. Huh? Jeremy does not stop looking at her. His face is unreadable. Shouldn't he be mad? But there's almost like a, a twinkle of intrigue in his eyes. Corey, on the other hand, there's a fucking twinkle of homicidal. He wants to kill Lowen. What the hell is she doing turning down this type of deal? <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. Could I get a moment alone with my client, please? The Pantom press people, they move out of the room and Corey is ready to start going off on Lowen, but Jeremy stops at the door. Actually, I would like a word in private with Miss Lowen. Not a request. More of like a, you are dismissed. Wait, who? To Corey. Oh. Corey begrudgingly leaves because can you believe this guy? Can you believe this asshole? Okay. Just ordering people out of the conference room. <laughs> Who does shit like that? He does. Okay. They both do. Anyway, Corey walks out and it's just the two of them again. And for some reason it feels, it feels comfortable. It feels normal. I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts and concerns. What do you want to know, Lowen? I don't get why your wife can't just finish the series herself. She was in a car accident. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't know. I didn't want anyone touching her series for the longest time. I was convinced that she would go on to make a full recovery and go back to doing what she loves. But, you know, it, it's come to this. So damn. Okay, he lost his daughter a few months ago. She drowned in the lake. That's what she found out in the bathroom. And then his wife was in a car accident and it's bad to the point that she can't even keep writing. I'm sorry. I really do appreciate being considered for this, but I just don't think it's something I can even, I don't know why your wife's editor even asked me to meet your book, your book open-ended. Excuse me? It was one of Verity's favorite books. Lo and goes still. Y your wife read one of, Verity Crawford read one of my books? She said you were going to be the next big thing. I'm the one that requested the meeting, though. They asked if I had anyone in mind, and your writing style seemed similar. And if anyone was going to finish what Verity started, I wanted it to be someone that she respected. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> I'm so flattered, but I... Some people have trauma attached to their backs. She's like, whoa. <laughs> like, these people, they be having two different conversations. I will say something about um, the dialogue in this book. Mm -hmm. They be having different conversations. Jeremy's staring out the window. Some people just have trauma attached to their backs. <laughs> okay, it wasn't this dramatic in the book, but like it was kind of dramatic. Just ready to eat away at them at any given point. Ready to strike. 
First, it was our two daughters. Daughters? I, I thought it was just one daughter in the lake. Twins. We lost Chaston six months before Harper passed in the lake. And then Verity's car accident. We're one of those families that seems to have tragedy attached to our names. Lowen is confused. Girly Pop is like, and what's that got to do with me, okay? Half a million. Excuse me? I know that we can do up to half a million. Tell them you'll do it with a pen name, ironclad NDA. Nobody knows that you're the one that helped Verity finish her series. I'm not sure what you're trying to hide, but that way you can keep hiding. I, I, I'm not, but Lowen stops herself. She's not in the mood to explain all of this to this man right now. Besides, he's just pushing forward like she already said yes, which is quite presumptuous. We live in Vermont. Sign the contract, come over. You'll need to go through Verity's office, her brain, her notes, everything. Stay as long as it takes. Lowen's head is buzzing. Half a million, a chance to pick Verity's brain, a chance to live in Vermont with what? With him and Verity? Okay. Okay. Jeremy smiles and walks out the conference room just like that. Okay. Corey rushes back in. Suddenly, suit man Corey is not looking so tough. Okay. I don't think I like that guy very much. He said that we're getting lowballed and we can push for half a million. Pen name, no press tour. Our identities are never revealed. Holy. Wait, so Corey's going to get a third of that? Uh huh. Dang, Corey. Holy fucking shit. Okay. Lowen thought that she was going to get married one time to this guy named Amos. But Amos liked being choked during sex. Lowen did not like that, mainly because she didn't trust herself to do that to someone. What if it escalated? Today it's choking, tomorrow it's first degree homicide. She's not going to put herself in that situation. She thought that she was going to marry this man, but now the idea of marrying him wants to make her gag. Maybe at one point she thought about marrying Corey too. Not that it mattered anymore because he's dating a girl named Jessica. Jessica. Jessica seems happy. Jessica seems like a heroic, fun, outgoing name. Anyway, they left the Pantom Press and now Corey is standing in her living room with a red eviction notice in his hand. Clearly she wasn't expecting him to come over or else she would have shamefully hid that in her underwear drawer or something. Where are you planning on staying once you get evicted? <laughs> well, I found a new place in Brooklyn and it's not like I want to stay here anyway, even if I get an advance check for the deal. After my mom passed away, I just, I just want to get out of here. I just want to start fresh. I'm applying for a new place in Brooklyn and for a few days, I can just put all my things in storage, go to Vermont, to Verity's to go through her notes and then Corey almost chokes on his champagne. Wait, why would you need to do that? Why do you need to go to Vermont? to write her books, to make half a million dollars, to make, to help make you make a third of that? Yes, but why don't they, why don't they just mail you the notes? 13 years of notes. Jeremy said that he wouldn't even know where to begin to start looking. He thought it'd be easier if I just go through them myself. Corey bites his lip and looks down at his champagne glass. What? Just say it, Corey. What are you thinking? <sighs> Nothing. It's just the literary world is, is small. We knew about his daughters and we knew about Verity's car accident. We didn't know that it was bad enough that she couldn't write anymore. I don't think anybody knows that. Look, all I'm saying is there weren't any skid marks. That's what they said. So that means she either fell asleep at the wheel or she did it on purpose. She slammed her car into that tree. Corey is acting like Inspector Hercule Perot, okay? And Lowen is not having it. Even if she did it on purpose, Corey, could you blame her? She lost her two daughters. I think it's a normal mother's reaction. Morbid, but I could see it. Well, regardless of if it's suspicious or not, the family clearly has bad luck and you're walking straight into their home and staying with them in their isolated mansion in Vermont. I'm just saying that house might have a lot of energy floating around. Dark things have happened there, just... Just be careful. Get what you need, get her notes, and then get out. Since when Corey cared? Exactly. Okay. Lowen is smiling at him, but she knows that he's not actually concerned for her. He's jealous. She could sense it when Jeremy basically kicked him out of the conference room. But it is too late for that, sir. She nicely kicks him out of her apartment and she starts packing. The drive to Verity's house is six hours. Lowen did the unavoidable during the drive. She turned on Verity's series in audiobook format and it was, look, it's unavoidable because she would have to read it before she starts writing. I mean, how do you finish a series that you've never read before? But maybe it was the fact that Verity was so mainstream, loved by the masses, that Lowen never picked up on any of her books. Maybe it was jealousy or maybe it's the book snob in her. 
because she thought, well, if everybody likes it, then I'm not going to like it. It must be bad. I think a part of Loan wanted it to be bad. That way it would be way less pressure for her to finish the series. She can't be bad when the whole series is already bad, right? Mm-hmm. Verity is really good. <laughs> really, really good. She managed to pull Loen out of her anxious thoughts about writing of how am I going to do this? How am I going to write like this? And threw her in a story that sucked her in. Her knuckles were gripping the steering wheel at one point, ghost white. Loen had to keep a pep talk, keep it going. She got to keep hyping herself up because all she wants to do is find a U-turn in the middle of Vermont and head all the way back home and call the whole deal off because there's no way that she can write like that. Except where is home? Her stuff is in a storage facility and she's, she's just, she's got to go to this mansion for the next few days until her Brooklyn apartment gets opened up and then she can move in there. This is the only choice. That's honestly the main reason that she doesn't run back home screaming and crying, but it is really, really good. But maybe- On the bright side, maybe the next five in the series suck. But also, maybe they're even better. (laughs) Fuck. Okay, but nobody told Loen how injured Verity is. Maybe she's just bed bound and Loen can just sit next to her in the bed, adjust her pillows, give her a sip of water through a little sippy cup or through a little straw straw, and then she can just dictate the next book, right? There's always that option, no? The six hours fly by and Loen finally registers that she's almost at the mansion. She pulls up to the driveway, if you can even call it a driveway. It's more like a street to the giant mansion, long winding road with thick green bushy trees on either side. It's super secluded. It's zen. It's fucking terrifying. She keeps driving, winding, winding until she sees the mansion get closer and closer. And it's beautiful, but it's not pretentious. It's too creepy to be pretentious. The house is constructed from this dark stone. And the only color is the blood red door and the green ivy leaves that are just going up the mansion. Mm. It's well taken care of. The property is in pristine condition. Everything is well manicured, but it's definitely the type of house you would expect a thriller writer to live in. It's not a modern mansion. It's not... It's not overly obnoxious, flexy, like, look at how many chandeliers I have. It's just, um, it's fucking creepy, beautiful, but haunting. That's what it feels like. Lowen's apartment could probably fit into the foyer of this house. How does she know? She knows because she studied every single picture of this house on Zillow. That's how she knows. She probably knows how much the couple pays in property taxes every single year for this place. Isolated, three acres of dense, tall dogwood trees all in the back. Lake in the back, privately for the use of the residents of the property, nobody else. Everything is beautiful and yet not over the top. It feels like a home for a family. Too bad they keep dying. Lowen parks her Kia Soul in the front. It does kind of look goofy next to the house. Okay, she wonders if Verity had ever even sat in a Kia Soul. The car that she smashed into a tree was a Range Rover. So, must be nice. There's that. Anyway. Oh, sh- you scared me. She's like deep in her thought and there's just this child standing in front of her, staring intently at her. A little boy. And it's clear it's the Crawford's little boy. He looks just like Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy's mini me, same green eyes. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, do you live here? Yes. Loen looks up at the mansion and she mutters, must be nice. Well, it used to be. He turns on his heel and walks straight for the blood red front door. Loen tries to keep up, but right when she gets to the door, the boy has already walked through into the house and slammed the front door shut straight in her face (laughs) and click, it's locked. (laughs) What the hell? I mean, I think it's very mean to call kids names, but this kid is a fucking asshole, okay? She thought for a second that this was a prank, that he was gonna, he was gonna hee hee and then open the door and be like, just kidding, hee hee, I'm five, but no. No, nobody's fucking opening the door. So she keeps ringing the doorbell and just standing there awkwardly until she sees Jeremy through the frosted glass running down the stairs. He opens it up. Sorry, I told crew, um, our son to get the door. I guess he was distracted. Yeah distracted okay jeremy is no longer in a suit with a spare shirt on he's in sweatpants a comfy shirt socks no shoes he looks comfortable yet so hot (laughs) is she really doing this right now she do be doing it yeah she do be doing it 
Lowen steps inside and pretends like she hasn't studied all the pictures on Zillow. She doesn't know that the kitchen is on the right, right where she expected it to be. Living room on the left, right where she expected it to be. Staircase leads to the second floor, right exactly where she expected it to be. She also took a guess. The kitchen would have dark cherry cabinets. It's moody, but everything is new and updated. It's dark, but not in a cheap way. The oven is like that $15,000 vintage oven, but it's not actually vintage. It's like a luxury oven, but then it looks vintage. It's the aesthetic. That's what that kitchen is. It's dark, but in an expensive, mysterious way. She pokes her head in. Yeah, the kitchen is exactly how she saw it on the pictures. Okay, fine. It's a little creepy. She even looked up the kids' deaths, but like, we'll get into that. Jeremy kids grabs- death? Yeah, because the two daughters died. Oh, so she, she'd be Googling it, okay? Now, Jeremy grabs Lowen's suitcase and starts leading her into the master bedroom. She's panicked, but what can she say? Like, wait, sir, I know you're leading me into the master bedroom right now because I studied the architectural plans for this home to the point where I even know where all the light switches are. But um, are we going to touch privates tonight? Because why are you leading me to the master bedroom? But she doesn't say anything. And he interrupts her little panic. I hope you don't mind. We changed the sheets a long time ago, um, but this is the master bedroom. We all sleep upstairs now since that's where Verity is. This is kind of like our guest room now. Bathroom's all yours. All of our stuff is pretty much moved out. There shouldn't be anything that you need, but if you are missing something, just let us know. Lowen's nodding and she's just staring into the room. Don't get me wrong. It's a beautiful room, but all she can focus on are the bite marks on the headboard. What? Clearly, before the car accident, they were doing lots of fun stuff. Bite mark? They don't want to clean that up or some. It's. I guess it's like a wood headboard and the bite marks are just... Imprinted? In, yeah. That's... Crazy. <laughs> don't look at the... Okay, she blushes and she tries to think about something else. Like the fact that there's no lock on the bedroom door. She's never slept without a lock on the room door. Which... Jeremy did say that he could put a lock on it, but she felt like that'd be weird to say yes. Jeremy leads her on a tour of the rest of the place and most importantly, upstairs to meet Verity. Verity has a nurse that comes in and stays with her every day. At nights, when she's asleep, the nurse leaves and the family can rest. And by the morning, the nurse will be back to take care of Verity. And Lowen doesn't know this. She doesn't know how bad the car accident was. It seems like whether it was intentional for the book series or for her family privacy, very few articles talk about the accident. And when they do, they just state that it was minor injuries. But if she can't even write, that doesn't sound like minor injuries, does it now? It's a waste of time to even think because the second Jeremy opens the door to one of the bedrooms on the second floor, Lowen gets all of her answers. I don't know what she was expecting, but Verity is laying on a bed and it's one of those hospital looking beds. Her blonde hair is loose and splayed out on the bed almost beautifully. She looks dead. She looks dead. What? The nurse in blue scrubs is putting socks on her feet. Crew, the little five-year-old boy, is laying in bed with his mom, playing on his iPad. But Verity's eyes are open. They're just empty. A woman, a young woman, just walked into the room with her husband and nothing. She's unaware, uninterested, not registering a single thing in those eyes. Jeremy what? leans over and brushes the hair from her face. But again, nothing. Not even a flicker of her eyes. Not a move, nothing. They're just glazed over in whatever direction that her head has been laid, which she can't move her head. The nurse tells Jeremy Verity is tired, so they're going to let her sleep early tonight. Lowen is also introduced to the nurse April, but instead of calling her Lowen, Jeremy introduces her as Laura Chase. So that's the fake name that Lowen is going to be using to be Verity's co-author for the rest of her series. Laura Chase. It sounds like a porn name. <laughs> so Lowen gets the vibe that April, the nurse, does not like her. And you know what? Why would she? Okay, I'm sure as Verity's nurse that she has an attachment to Verity. And here comes this new young woman living in their house with their hot young husband, or maybe, or maybe, I don't know. Lowen is overthinking things, but April is looking her up and down. I thought you'd be older. It's good to meet you, April. April smiles and turns to Jeremy and tells him that she's leaving for the night and that Verity is all tucked in. So they all take one last look at Verity before wishing her good night and they shut the lights and close the door. Her eyes were still open. <laughs> the hardest moment of my entire adult life was trying to cancel an old gym membership. <laughs> 
I'm being dramatic, but also I'm not. My first mistake was being ambitious enough to get a gym membership, but my second mistake was thinking that it'd be easy to cancel it. After like 20 minutes on the phone with a customer service agent, they somehow talked me into renewing instead of canceling. And then they were like, ooh, you know what's even better? If you don't want to come to the gym, we've got this online gym membership program where you get access to a subscription-based service where you get to watch these like workout videos. That's when I realized that modern problems require modern solutions. And I got a Rocket Money subscription. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. When I first used Rocket Money, I didn't think it'd be that bad. I figured maybe I have like two subscriptions that I wasn't regularly using. I had... I feel like I had more than 10, okay, if I'm not mistaken. I don't recall because those were some dark times, but it was a lot. Thankfully, Rocket Money makes it super easy to cancel because all of my subscriptions were in one place and I just had to make a couple of taps over the ones I didn't want anymore. Which side note, you think that subscriptions are just like video subs, like, oh, video streaming services. I had so many subscriptions to random things. Like I would want to read an article at one random publication, but I would need a subscription and then I would get that. It, it was a whole thing. Rocket Money also helped me stick to my financial goals. They have a dashboard that shows me this month's spending compared to last month. So I can clearly see my spending habits and then I can make a custom budget to keep my online shopping from spiraling out of control. Rocket Money will even try to negotiate and lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is submit a picture of your bill and Rocket Money will handle the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of 500 million in canceled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash baking. That's rocketmoney.com slash baking. Rocketmoney.com um, slash baking. So they never talked about what happened to her. Like what kind of illness, what what will happen, just just the car accident. Jeremy ushers crew to take a shower and shows Lo into Verity's office. And this office is incredible. Wood double doors that lead into the most stunning room an author could dream of. Glass down windows that look directly into the beautiful lake and trees in the back. Only right now it's late. So everything is dark and it's a bit creepy. The desk is massive. The desk is as long as the wall of windows and every single inch of not just the desk, but the entire room is covered in papers, notes, manuscripts. The walls, beautiful shelving, had any other family, had any other person lived here, it would probably be beautifully filled with books arranged in this neat, clean way. But since it's Verity, every single square inch of the shelves were crammed with books and papers and notes. Multiple computers, laptops are all laying around the office. She has a laptop and a desktop that she mainly works off of. The passwords are on the sticky notes next to it. I'm not sure how long it's going to take you to get through the room. She did have a habit of writing down notes for big plot lines on practically anything that she could get her hands on. In the shower, she would write it on shampoo bottles. One time she got a Sharpie at a zoo and wrote an idea on Crew's diaper because she didn't have a notepad. That she wrote it on an animal. <laughs> <laughs> Come back, zebra. Zebra. <laughs> Which line did I write it on? <laughs> Which line did I write it on? Oh my god, you're getting funny. <laughs> Stop it. Lowen is smiling and nodding as she's scanning the room. But on the inside, she's full on freaking panicking because what the f***? How is she going to get through this room? You're more than welcome to stay as long as you need. I'd rather you take your time and make sure that you get everything you need for the last three bucks. Nine books. The series is supposed to be nine books. Six have been published. Three are still yet to be delivered. It's called The Noble Virtues. Each book is a different virtue, and each book is interestingly written from the perspective of the villain. That almost never happens in thriller books. And Verity does it so well. The way that she's able to capture their emotions and feelings, it's not a caricature of a villain. It feels raw. And now, the only thing left for Lowen to do is write courage, truth, and honor. The last three virtues. She felt no courage or honor, but I don't know. Maybe she would find some truth in this crazy office, okay? On top of that, she hasn't even read the full series yet. Uh, Jeremy, what's your favorite book of the series? Jeremy looks at her deadpan. I haven't read any of them. I mean, I read, oh. her, I read her first one, but aside from that, I never read her work. I, I don't like being inside of her head. It feels oddly intimate. What? Anyways, I will go. Um, just let you get into it. Lowen smiles and Jeremy slides out the oak doors. Interesting. What is that like? To know that your wife created a separate world that you've never seen, that you're not a part of? Yeah, that's so weird. Yeah. 
Loan runs her fingers against the office desk and then on the leather chair and she sits down. She thinks the leather chair alone probably costs more than her entire month's rent at Loan's apartment. Maybe it's the jealousy poking out. Maybe it's her just being realistic with the unfair balance of the world. But Loan wonders, well, she thinks being rich makes you more creative. That's her theory. Having all the computers you want, the perfect desk, the perfect view, Wi-Fi that never shuts off. Rowan could have written a New York Times bestseller too if she had all those things. Loan reaches up and grabs a book off the shelf, the second book to the series, and she finished the first one in the car ride, right? So now she's thinking, okay, maybe I'll read a chapter or two of the second one. Nothing too crazy. I got to sleep early and start tackle this in the morning. But the pages keep turning. The characters in this series are not your normal characters. They're just so f- up and it's so intriguing Lowen would pause at times to question what the fork she just read but also how the hell is she going to get herself in the mindset to write to nail all of these story arcs before she knew it she texts the time three hours have passed hush Lowen gets up to stretch but she realizes she doesn't need to stretch because the chair is that good she doesn't feel any sort of ache and pain that she normally would back at home it is the most comfortable piece of furniture that her ass has ever squished Okay, focus. This is not restoration hardware. This is book writing mission. Maybe Verity has some sort of outline or storybook line that she keeps to keep track of all of her characters and other motivations. She starts going through the boxes of the manuscripts one by one. They're all manuscripts of books that she's already published. So that's unhelpful. But box six, she finds something interesting. A manuscript called So Be It. At first, Lowen thought, is that an outline for the seventh book in the series? Like, how convenient would that be? But when she flips it open to the first page, it feels like a diary. It feels like deeply personal and raw and way too candid. First time, sometimes I think about the night that I met Jeremy. And I wonder, had we not met each other's eyes at that party, would my life still end the same? Was it my destiny from the beginning to suffer a tragic end? So it sounds like Verity wrote this after her daughters died. But before her car accident, Lowen drops the manuscript onto her lap. This is not an outline for a fictional book. This is an autobiography. This is the story of Verity's life. At this point, it's none of her business. It's not her job. But Lowen is like, but maybe it is my job. Because if I read it, I can get a better idea of who Verity is. And then I can write better from her perspective. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's read it. Lowen sits on the couch, makes herself comfortable, opens up the first page. So Be It by Verity Crawford. The first page is an author's note. It's more like a warning to the viewer. It's Verity's opinion of autobiographies. Autobiographies are not so that the writer can be liked. That's the worst type of autobiography. It's dishonest. If done correctly, every reader should come out of this autobiography kind of hating the person who wrote it. It should be the rawest form of communication and writing there is. Ugly, honest, terrifying, and vile. Complete exposure. Cut someone open and show them your insides. Nothing more, nothing less. And that is what I promise to deliver. In the end, she believes her autobiography will hurt her, hurt the reader, and hurt anyone involved because that's what life is. Life is painful. Chapter one, quote, find what you love and let it kill you. Chapter one opens with how Verity and Jeremy met, and it all starts with a stolen red dress. Verity stole a red dress from the store. She didn't want to steal it, but life is tricky, you know? She needs money for food and the red dress, but not for both. She chose both. Besides, the red dress was an investment. It was perfect. A lot of women think that the best dress is the one that shows off all your curves. You throw on some shapewear underneath and boom, you look good. The guys don't care about that though. They want to know how easy it is to slip their hand up your dress. They don't care about shapewear. They want to know if you guys can go to the bathroom and hump one out, okay? That's what makes a dress good. Forget the fancy dress with 239 zippers and buttons to undo. You look good, but that's not what men want. That's what Verity is saying. Verity knew what men wanted. She just didn't want men. At least not long term anyway. She had flings here and there, always with rich men. That was her type, but that was about it. The red dress would probably get her into the charity party. She would fuck a rich investment banker, maybe for a few weeks, get some money out of him. And who knows? She could invest that money into some sort of shelter for sick dogs or some other charity. So technically, she's not stealing. She's giving. She will make good use of the stolen red dress. And her target already staring at her from across the room of the charity gala. Suit, tie, one champagne glass in his hand. Rich, you either come to a charity function because you have more than enough money to give away to whoever makes you smile, or you come to work. Judging by the fact that he's mingling and drowning glasses of expensive drinks and not handing them out, he's rich. 
Verity knew what she was doing. She would give him a look across the room. He would stop the conversation with the other rich men and gulp down a sip of champagne. Verity smirked and makes her way over to the bar. Then he shows up, places a hand on her shoulder. She turns around. They make eye contact. No words. He's claiming her. The hand on the shoulder. And that confidence is intoxicating. He tells the bartender, she'll have a water. Did uh-huh. he just did he just tell the bartender that she's going to have a water? Like, who the hell does he think he is? She wants a fucking vodka soda. Excuse you. Excuse you? I've been watching you since the moment that you walked into the party. You've had three drinks in the past hour. If you keep that up, I wouldn't feel comfortable taking you home with me. I'd much rather you be sober. This guy is doing a lot. And that was all it took. Verity was in love. Every time he touched her, she felt like her skin was on fire. Verity ordered a water at the bar, drank it while maintaining eye contact with this man. And then he grabs her hand, walks out the charity event and opens the door into a long ass limousine. It's like the whole block. Okay. (laughs) It smells like perfume. He came in here with a girl, but why isn't he leaving with the girl? Huh? Either way, Verity doesn't give a fork. She just wants to fork this man. But Jeremy is making her wait. He doesn't even try to make a move right away. He just sits in his limo staring at her. He looks at her with all the cockiness in the world. The look tells her that he knows she already said yes tonight. He doesn't need to rush or try to keep convincing her. He already won. It's in the bag. And then they pounce. They're on top of each other, making out, asking each other their names in the middle of makeout sessions names ages he's 27 she's 22 she's a writer and he's well he's rich what more do you need to know about that okay what do rich people even do in the midst of their makeout session tongues deep in their esophaguses verity pulls back and asks where his driver is she's trying to get a bed under her asap and jeremy smirks i don't know this isn't my limo (laughs) wait 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 verity could not tell if this man is joking or not wait what (laughs) then whose limo is it i have no clue I have a Honda Civic. It's parked around the block. (laughs) Verity only likes rich men. This man just told her he is not rich. But something about the way that he brought her into a limousine that wasn't even his and the confidence he has and the fact that he's ready to fork her in the back. She needs this man in her life. Guys, get your mind out the gutter, okay? Uh In her life, okay? Verity admits to him between makeout sessions. I found an invite in the trash can while I was cleaning office buildings nearby. I'm not supposed to even be at the party. So they're getting more passionate, but then the door slams open and the limo driver gets in into the driver's seat. The two in the back freeze still on top of each other. And then they burst out laughing, swing open the door and they start running. The limo driver gets out. What the hell were you doing in my car? They make it around the corner. Jeremy grabs Verity, slams her up against a Honda Civic parked on the street and starts making out with her. She pulls back. Is this really your car? Jeremy smirks, clicks the key fob. <laughs> it beep, beep. Okay, Verity was ready to do it right then and there. But being the gentleman that he is, he wants to treat her to food first before he eats her for the main course. You get it. He takes her to Steak and Shake, where he spends every last penny of his money to buy her a meal while he's doing some things under the table. Listen, if I were at that restaurant, I'd be like, damn, this girl really likes food. She's a foodie. Why is she aggressively moaning? I don't know. Wait, what? Like at Steak and Shake? At Steak and Shake. Not even like a Shake and Steak. (laughs) Not even a Shake Shack. Not even a steakhouse at a steak and shake. Mm. Steak and shake is pretty fire, but yeah, Yeah, it's pretty fire. Honestly, he told her that he wasn't going to let her milkshake at the restaurant, which honestly, she just wanted to milkshake it up. He takes her to his Brooklyn loft instead, which you know what? Why do they always do this? Why do they always say, oh my God, this person is so broke. Meanwhile, loft in Brooklyn. (laughs) Please, that is crazy. That is wild. Do you know how much lofts in Brooklyn are? They're really expensive. Rent aside, they start doing it. And Verity is obsessed. She said that she never felt love, but she felt it that night. She felt it hard. She did not leave his apartment for three days. They ordered food delivery and stayed naked the entire time. And Verity could feel it. This is endgame. They loved each other more than anything in this world. And they were going to live, breathe, and die for each other. That is until he found the one thing that he loves more than her. And it would ruin everything 
What the fork did Lowen just read? She feels like she has absolutely no business reading something so utterly personal, but also she can't unimagine Jeremy naked right now because it just confirmed that he's really good in bed. So it's just kind of stuck in her head. Lowen gets up from the couch to clear her mind a little bit and checks her phone. 11 p.m already she's starving this whole office feels like a black hole it just sucks you in and it traps you and it's probably soundproof because when she was reading that manuscript it felt like there was no outside world just her verity and jeremy in bed weird okay lowen decides to get some food in her system before deciding what to do next she opens the door to the office and steps out when she hears thumping noises and her eyes go wide because she's about to gasp but she puts her hand over her face not that Jeremy's gonna hear her anyway, because she read about this before. This is horrendous. One time a female patient in a, in a coma became pregnant, even though she could not consent because a male nurse was just assaulting her, impregnated her. Wow. And Jeremy is up there right now doing his what? I can turn it off if it bothers you. Lowen whips around and there's Jeremy staring at her with a curious look on his face. It's a bed that helps Verity move around at night so she doesn't develop bed sores. <laughs> <sighs> right. That makes sense. Lowen thought that he was assaulting his bedridden wife when in reality, um, rich people just have access to rich people gadgets. So great. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. The two decide to eat leftover pizza in the kitchen and uh, Lowen hates pizza, but she loves eating pizza with Jeremy. <laughs> what is going on? I don't know. I don't know. And they just really liked being around each other because both of them have experienced grief before. Get a room, haven't we all? But every time Lowen looks at his hands, her face gets red and she has to look away because she remembers what Verity was writing about his big, strong hands, just like grasping and cupping and squeezing and... <laughs> 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 okay. What the hell was that? <laughs> so she needs to distract herself before he finds out what she knows. She feels embarrassed. Oh, um, did Verity ever talk to you about how she wanted to end the series? I don't think so. If she did, I don't recall. How long ago was her accident? Side note, Lowen already be knowing. She already Googled everything that she could find on this family, but you know what? Small talk. Soon after Harper died, she was in a medically induced coma for a while, then a rehab center, and she's been home now for the past few weeks. It's fascinating. Lowen can't imagine Jeremy's life. What is that like? To have a beautiful, successful wife that has everything you ever wanted in someone? Well, other than whatever else he loves more than her that Verity was talking about. But to have all of that, the perfect life and the perfect children, then lose the children, and then now you're stuck caring for someone that's your wife, but at the same time isn't your wife, or at least not the wife that you fell in love with because she's not even there. But also, now that Lowen is thinking about it, how does she know that this autobiography is even an autobiography? Because now that she's chomping on her pizza, she's thinking she has a few author friends that will use their own names and their own husband's names as placeholders until they can find a name for their character. Mm. There's only one way to find out. How did you and Verity meet? Oh, um, he starts smiling and leaning back in his chair like he's reminiscing. At a party, she was wearing the most incredible red dress I'd ever seen in my life. God, she's, she was beautiful. We left the party together, went into a limo out front and talked a while till the driver showed up and I had to admit to her that the limo wasn't mine. I just wanted to impress her that night. Lowen noticed how Jeremy is lost in thought, probably thinking about Verity in that fuckable red dress, okay? Yeah, we were uh, inseparable after that. Was Verity already writing her series when you guys met? No, uh, she actually started writing it when I had to go out of town for work for a few months. I guess she needed something to lose herself in. By the time I got back, she finished her manuscript, she sold it, and almost everything changed practically overnight. And she liked the change, the fame? Yeah, I think I was the one that struggled with it the most. Because you like being invisible. Isn't that obvious? First of all, how the fuck is that obvious, okay? <laughs> but like, okay. But Verity, she loves the spotlight. Or she did. She likes being around people, the fancy events. For me, I just liked being at home with the kids. Lowen could see the pain in his eyes, the, the grief, the isolation. She remembers what Corey said, that he might be sus, but there's just no way. Lowen writes suspense novels. She knows this man is not trying to get sympathy or trying to gain some sort of pity or upper hand. That's not it. He's being genuine. Lowen lost her mom. She could spot the grief in other people. The two of them just share some silence together, basically trauma bonding before Jeremy gets up, cleans their plates. Well, thank you for dinner. I should um, get some sleep now. Good night, Lo. Lowen stops at the door when she hears that. 
<laughs> Yo, that's sus. A <laughs> nickname? <laughs> But now Lowen is even more curious. What the hell happens next? What on earth did Jeremy love more than Verity? Lowen is dying to read more of the manuscript, but she just drove six hours, read for another like what, six hours nonstop. She knows that she needs a good night rest in order to think clearly tomorrow. So next day she wakes up. Chapter two, so be it, Verity autobiography. Verity wishes she could write a whole autobiography just on the beginning of her relationship with Jeremy. But it would just be sex. Like it would straight up just be hardcore intimate relations, okay? But even from chapter two of the book, you can tell that Verity is obsessive. She seems like a crazy obsessed woman. Even with Jeremy, she this is wild. She got rid of her apartment lease, put most of her stuff in a storage and just stopped going home. She stayed with him nonstop because, because why not? They basically live together. Why not just move in without him knowing that you moved in? One day while they're doing it, he asked her to move in while they're, you know, and she confessed that she already moved in without telling him and yeah he did not think that was cool he got kind of upset and per- kind of creeped out by her actions but she distracted him by sitting on his face and then biting the headboard what <laughs> everything started changing though once he got his little temporary job in la he had to move there for a few months and verity remembers pretending a pillow is jeremy and then biting the headboard but it just wasn't like hitting the same you know what i mean <laughs> Verity knew it was obsessive. Like she knew she was going crazy while he was in LA, but she knew that if she kept calling him, if she kept texting him, he would run away. So she had to rein it in and pretend like she was chill. So in all of her spare time, she would write a book. She wasn't trying to publish it. She was just, she wanted a main character named Lane. And in her mind, Lane was Jeremy. And whenever she missed Jeremy, she would write about Lane. When he finally got home, they would have this wild, reunited, intimate relations. And while she was in the bathroom washing up, he finds her manuscript, reads the whole thing while she's trying to kick down the door, begging him to stop reading it. It's embarrassing. But worst of all, what if it sucked? Then he would think that she was a bad writer. And for some reason, the idea of him thinking something like that of her would have crushed her entire being. He would think less of her, but he was her world. So she slips onto the ground in defeat and just waits for him to come out. When the door finally clicks unlocks, he slips out. He looks at her. Verdi, what? It's good. It's really, really good. And there it was. From then on, their lives were never the same. That night in bed while they're doing it for the 189th time in this single chapter, he asked her to marry him. Because he was her biggest fan. And that day, she said, was the day that she, the day she got engaged was the day she became pregnant with his children. And that would mark the day that she was no longer his number one. He found something that he loved more than her. The twins, the babies that she was pregnant with. And that would never be okay. Bruh. And that is where I leave you with ah! part one. Is she going to kill her kids or not? Oh You're about to find God. out in part two. So this is going to be split into three parts. So I'm going to see you guys the next Monday and then the Monday after that. And we're going to finish this book in three parts. But I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh. Ah! what are your thoughts and let me know what other colleen hoover books that you guys enjoy in the comments and i will see you guys in the next one bye